This video will talk about scleroderma, its types, how do we diagnose it, and its treatment. So from the name here, we can realize that scleral means fibrosis and derma means its skin. So it's mainly fibrosis of the skin. This is the whole mark of the disease. Now there is a cause. Now this cause is unknown, but it is presumed that it could be a result of a viral infection. Now what you need to know is the result of this infection. There is vessel disruption as well as fibrosis. And as a result of these both pathophysiologies, we have two main manifestations. One is the skin manifestations and two is the extra skin or non-skin manifestations. And the non-skin manifestation we're talking about Reynolds phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, telangiectasia which is dilated vessels and dyspnea secondary to pulmonary hypertension as well as arthralgia and calcinosis. Now the skin manifestation can be divided based on the extent or the region that's involved with the fibrosis. We have distal to the elbows and proximal to the elbow in addition to the trunk and thighs. Now distal to the elbows, this includes mainly or what we call limited scleroderma. Now, the proximal trunk and thighs, this is diffuse scleroderma. Now, when they studied patients with limited scleroderma, they found that their non-skin manifestations are different or more specific towards them compared to diffuse scleroderma. And this is include the crest syndrome or crest manifestations, which means they are more associated with calcinosis, Raynaud phenomena, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, which is thickening of the fingers, skin thickening of the fingers, as well as telangiectasia. Now important to note that around 10% of the patients with scleroderma don't have skin manifestations and we call them sign scleroderma which means without scleroderma i.e. without skin fibrosis. So the question now when do you think about scleroderma? First thing that you will notice is the patient has skin thickening and when you try to feel his hand for example you will see that there is hardness and tethering of the skin. Then you will ask the patient, do you have any Raynaud history? And they probably will mention that to you. Since we know that secondary Raynaud is more severe than primary Raynaud, and the patient might develop ulceration as well as more severe symptoms. And the reason I'm focusing on these two manifestations is they are present in around 90% of patients with scleroderma, which means they are very sensitive markers if you think about it. Now, once you suspect scleroderma, ask about the other manifestations we talked about, like dyspnea, calcinosis, ask about if they have any shortness of breath, as well as examine them and see if they have telangiectasia, etc. Now, for diagnosing scleroderma, what do you need to do? First, you have to rule out all the other diseases, as it is a diagnosis of exclusion. You want to check ANA, double-stranded DNA, Smith, as well as rheumatoid factor and CCP. Now, ANA is around 95% present in scleroderma itself, so you need to check double stranded DNA and Smith to rule out SLE. The next thing you want to check the specific antibodies for scleroderma, and these include anti SCL70 and anti centromere, as well as anti RNA polymerase. Now, you need to know which ones are associated with limited versus diffuse scleroderma. SCL70 and RNA polymerase are associated with diffuse or systemic sclerosis, while centromere is associated with limited sclerosis. Next, you want to know what is the prognostic value of each of them. So SCL70 is associated with worse interstitial lung disease, while RNA polymerase is associated with worse skin and kidney disease. These are potentially questions. They like you to know what is the prognostic value of these antibodies in addition to which diseases or which type of scleroderma they are associated with. Now, if the three of them are positive, then this is very highly specific for scleroderma and it can reach up to 99% specificity. Next, you want to know what workup you need to do if you diagnose a patient with scleroderma. First, you want to check an echocardiogram to see if they have any pulmonary hypertension. Then you want to check pulmonary function test to establish a baseline and use this as a monitoring way 
for the disease progression in the next visits. And you want to check urine analysis to see if they have kidney involvement, and that will be as proteinuria. Now, regarding management, if the patient comes to the emergency department with history of scleroderma and they come with hypertensive emergency slash urgency, then these patients you want to consider scleroderma crisis. Usually, they will have acute kidney injury as well associated with that. Why we need to recognize that? Because their drug of choice or their management of choice is not going to be nitro or calcium channel blockers. It's going to be ACE inhibitor. And usually, they use captopril for that treatment. Now, what about management of the systemic disease itself? So, it is organ-specific management, which means every organ has a different management and you have to treat every organ differently. For example, skin involvement, if it's limited or diffuse, it's going to be different. Limited, you can use just topical steroids as well as tacrolimus in addition to phototherapy. While diffuse skin involvement, you want to use methotrexate in these patients. Now, if the patient has calcinosis, then you want to treat these patients with minocycline if they become infected, as well as surgery if symptoms don't improve. And the reason we are using minocycline here, it has some anti-inflammatory benefits as well as chelation activity against the calcium. Next, what if the patient has interstitial lung disease, then the drug of choice is going to be mycophenolate. If the patient has arthritis, then NSH should be enough. And you can add the hydroxychloroquine as if the symptoms are severe. Myo or pericarditis, these patients have heart failure symptoms. You want to manage that as acute heart failure. And sometimes they might require an ICD or CRT insertion as well. Now, steroids is controversial, but you still can use it. The reason it's controversial, it can worsen the kidney function in patients with scleroderma. You can as well use cyclophosphamide if you don't want to use steroids. Now, if the patient has pulmonary hypertension, then you want to know this is worse than the primary pulmonary hypertension. It does not respond to all the treatment, including the calcium channel blockers. It has better response with anti-endothelin and phosphodiesterase inhibitors like bosentan or sildenafil, respectively. So just a recap here, where do we use systemic immunosuppressants in patients with scleroderma? And these include interstitial lung disease, we use mycophenolate. Diffuse skin disease, we use methotrexate. And in patients with severe arthritis, we use hydroxychloroquine. And patients with myocarditis, you can use steroids plus cyclophosphamide. And that's it for scleroderma. Hope you guys learned something and see you in the next one.